Hi everybody, I'm Cynthia Garrett and welcome to the sessions. And joining me today is a multi-platinum selling worship leader. Christina Reynolds is over there, our musical guest leader, and she's sort of giving you a little bit of a preview of this song. And I know you may have heard it, some of you, many of you. He's also the head pastor of Calvary Chapel San Clemente, and he's also my very good friend, Holland Davis. And I am really happy to welcome him to the sessions because he's going to make my job very easy today. <laughs> Hello, hey. Holland. Hey, how are you doing? I'm good, and I know you know Christina, so you can say hi, Christina. Hello. Hey, Hello. Christina. <laughs> <laughs> I love Holland. I know. I know, you know, I, I, there's so many places we can go, but before, like, as we get into this, I like to do an overall arc. So would you talk to me a little bit about the Jesus movement and when you got saved? Okay. Well, I actually got saved when I was 13 and it was in, I was in Japan actually at the time. The Jesus movement had just kind of hit over there. And we had these guys that came from the musical hair. They were in Germany. They were visiting in Japan in this little uh, Young Life Bible study. And uh, I remember sitting there on the floor of this Bible study and, and they would just read the Bible. They didn't teach it or anything, they just read it. And so he was reading out of John chapter three, the whole chapter. And then when he got to uh, John 3, 16, you know, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. As soon as he said those words, I heard a voice, an audible voice say, Holland, I love you. And when I heard that, I just started weeping. I mean, I was like sobbing. I felt this incredible sense of love just come all over my body. And so I'm right up front, you know, and I'm sitting in front of the Bible study leader and, he, and he's watching me, you know, lose it. And so he did, you know, what anybody would have done at that moment. He kind of kicked me and he says, hey, man, can you hold it down? You're interrupting the Bible study. And so, <laughs> and so I was like, I can't stop this. You know, I mean, God was really ministering to me. And so. I left that Bible study that night and I said, you know, if you're that real God, I'll follow you all the days of my life. And that's what I've done. I've just followed him. And I didn't realize that we were in a revival. I didn't know it was, you know, the Jesus movement. It wasn't really something that I was aware of. All I know is that God made himself real to me. And, um, and I began following him. And it, it was, uh, you know, from there, my dad moved, he was in the military. We moved back to the States and eventually ended up in California where I would listen to the radio, hear this guy named Chuck Smith uh, talk about the Bible. And uh, I just became in love with the Bible. And uh, then I found out they're just, you know, we were living in Vista and I found out they're up in Costa Mesa and we would make the trip up there to to go to the concerts and we began to see what God was doing. And uh, it was, it was unbelievable. You know, there were, you know, it, it would be the kind of thing where, where the, the evangelist would come out, you know, Tom Stipe or um, Jimmy Kepner or some of the guys. And they would say, you know, before we get started, the Lord told me that there are people here that want to get saved. So just come up right now. And like hundreds of people, no preaching, nothing, just, hundreds of people would flood forward and they would come to Christ. And then they would do the concert, they would preach the gospel and they say, now who else wants to get saved? And again, the place that hundreds of people would just come forward and receive Christ. And, you know, it was the kind of thing where we would come early. You had to come early to get to church because they would be there for an hour waiting just to get inside the building. I mean, how many churches, uh, you, you see where people are waiting in line to get in church, you know, it just really doesn't happen, right. but it was happening. And, um, and God was just moving incredibly. And, and I didn't realize, you know, the benefit of, of being around that environment until, you know, later on in my life where I realized that, man, there's a whole generation of people that don't know what revival is that never saw God do something so amazingly incredible that all over the world, spontaneously, at the same time, thousands of people were coming to Christ. That's 
I'm, I'm, I'm trying not to like sit here with my mouth wide open because honestly, I have to tell you, uh, being a Californian, you know, I, I, I'd heard about the Jesus movement and obviously my husband, Roger, who's a very good friend of yours um, for a long, long, long time, he speaks about it. And I, I always say to people who watch my show, like, you know, Roger is the, Roger is the spiritual foundation and I'm the one with the gift of gab, but, and somehow it works together. But, but you got to set the context for me. I had no idea that the Jesus movement was happening all around the world. I mean, you're a young boy in Japan being impacted by the same move of God that was tearing, like literally flipping California upside down. Right. Yeah. It was happening all over. It was happening in Texas. It was happening at in Chicago, it was happening, you know, where we were at, it was happening in Europe. I mean, God was moving all over the planet. And that's really when you know it's a true revival, a true move of God, because, you know, so much marketing hype, you know, the revival here, the revival there, and it, and it really only impacts maybe a small group of people, and it really doesn't last, you know. After, after a few years, it's like, where's the revival? You know, well, it wasn't really a true revival, a true revival impacts the whole world and it changes the world. Um, the Jesus movement changed the way church happened in America. I mean, we don't do church the same way. You know, before the Jesus movement, there were choirs and organs and pianos. After the Jesus movement, now we have rock bands in every church. That was a fruit of the Jesus movement. Um, wow. The preaching of the word of God, you know, uh, verse by verse, you know, before the Jesus movement, there was some of that, but mostly it was, you know, just people preaching topically through the scriptures. But, you know, through the ministry of Chuck Smith, uh, that model of teaching verse by verse from Genesis to Revelation, that is that the proliferation of that is a result of the Jesus movement you know, a hunger for the word of God. Wow. Okay. So that, that is exactly why I really felt the Lord tell me to have you on is because when I was sitting in church, um, a couple Sundays ago, uh, I was really impacted by what you said. You were speaking about why, why your job as a pastor is to teach the entire counsel of God. And yeah. I remember sitting there and I was listening to you and I was thinking, gosh, you know, my, myself in this situation, like, hmm, I want to make sure that I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. And I want to make sure that people who watch are learning the whole counsel of God. And, and it just has had me really thinking and thinking and praying about it. And so now I'm beginning to understand the DNA that you have and that my husband Roger has. And it obviously comes from Chuck Smith and that line by line teaching the word, the counsel of God. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's really, that's really kind of my whole Christian existence. That's really what I learned through example, through listening. And, you know, a lot of pastors will, will say, and people have actually criticized me from time saying, you know, Hey, you need to teach the whole counsel of God. And, uh, and, you know, usually what they mean is, first of all, you got to tell us how bad we are. You got to tell us how God doesn't like us and he's mad at us and we got to get our act together, you know. And then once we've gotten our act together or, or then, you know, then God will bless us. And then that's the whole counsel. You got to get the bad news to get to the good news. Right. But the, when you teach the whole counsel, that means to teach the whole thing from verse by verse, from Genesis to Revelation. And you can't really say you have taught the whole counsel of God as a preacher, as a pastor, until you have taught the whole counsel, the whole thing. Oh you know, goodness. other than that, you're just, you're just blowing smoke, you know. And so like this year uh, in, in, in November in our church, we will have completed the first time through the scriptures, you know, in our little church plant. How? And uh, How? Yeah, it's pretty crazy. <laughs> just going verse by verse from beginning to the end. And, you know, and I told my church, I said, you know, now I can say to you with authority that I have taught you the whole counsel of God. I've taught you everything God says from beginning to end. And so it's like people say, well, what are you going to do afterwards? I'm going to start again. And we're going to go through it again from the, you know, from uh, we actually, what I did is I taught Genesis, then I taught Revelation. Wow. So I, Say I've taught from Genesis to Revelation, which is actually cheating. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah, there's a few books now, in the middle. 
yeah, there's a few books in the middle. So then I went and I taught those books. And so we'll complete that in November, but then we're going to start in Revelation and go all the way through the scriptures again, uh, because there's so much there. Yeah. Um, I find so many people that are just so lost in their relationship with God and they don't know the promises God has for them. They don't know the prophecies that, that God said that he's going to fulfill in their lifetime. Mm -hmm. And they live defeated, they're depressed, they're filled with anxiety. And I'm like, man, if you just knew God's word, if you knew how much he loved you and how much uh, he wants to bless you because he says it, man, your life would be totally different. I, and I love that, just uh, not to interrupt you, but I love that you said that you were starting with Revelation because I got to tell you, uh, that is, well, first of all, that was always a book that, that was the, I was afraid of that one. Like, you know, ooh, yeah. no, that's the book that's really scary. Don't touch it, which is so not true. So not right. true. Like, I mean, we have to remember we win. So Revelation, yeah. <laughs> Revelation is really a celebration actually for, for us as believers. But it's so interesting because that, it was Revelation, that was the very first book that my son, right when he got saved, he just wanted to study, he and his best friend. And I thought it was so odd. And, and now that he, you know, after he started to get mature in the word and, and what have you, a few years later, and he's young, but he got mature pretty quickly because of, well, because of Roger and guys like you and Chuck Smith and Chuck Missler, like he, because of Roger, he just went deep fast. He didn't have a choice, yeah. you know? And I remember he said something to me a few years ago and he said, mom, starting in Revelation is really good because a lot of people, if they knew the end <clears throat> at the beginning, they would understand so much more about the entire Bible. So yeah. why do you choose to start in Revelation? Well, I, for one, I love the book of Revelation because Revelation is the completion of the story. It's, it's what most people, you know, the way it's taught mostly is like it's dealing with the church. But in reality, most of the book of Revelation is dealing with the nation of Israel. Um, after chapter four, until Jesus returns, um, it's dealing with the nation of Israel. And what God is doing in Revelation is he's fulfilling all of the promises that he made to Israel saying, I'm going to deliver you from your enemies. I'm going to destroy everyone that's against you. And, and he's not just talking about the nations, you know, like the, the um, you know, that are surrounding them, but he's talking about the demonic powers that from the very beginning have been trying to wipe Israel out. And so God in the book of Revelation destroys, wipes out, completely annihilates all of the demonic forces that have come against Israel and really that have come against his church, that have come against his people, his creation, and, and just the, 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 uh, what it takes to do that destroys a third of the planet. That's how deeply rooted these demonic powers are in, uh, in our world. But he's going to get rid of all of them. And so when he returns and sets up his kingdom, it's going to be completely different. It's going to be what he always wanted it to be. You know, he made us to live in a tropical paradise called Eden. That's right. why I think, you know, I like to go to tropical paradises because it reminds me, this is how I was supposed to live, you know? Yeah, <laughs> but, um, I usually do sort of lay down, start the first day with my book and go, ah, this is yeah. heaven. <laughs> <laughs> it is, because that's what we were made, how we were made to live. And he's going to restore all of that. We're going to be able to step into the life that he always intended us to live in reality here on planet Earth. It's just going to be amazing. Yeah, I have a question. Is it possible, do you think, to actually be living wrong as a Christian if you don't understand the whole counsel of God? Um, I, I don't always think of it in terms of living wrong, but I definitely think of it in terms of you're living under, you're like an underprivileged child. You know, you're, you're, it's like you're living on welfare stamps, yeah. you know, or a, instead of living in, man, in a mansion, you know, it's like that, it's that radical of a difference, you know, when you actually understand what God has promised you, you know, it's, it's unbelievable and it will change the way you live. It'll change the way um, you know, people see you and the way you see yourself. You won't let people put labels on you. You know, the world wants to put labels on people. 
We want to tell them, you know, about their sexuality. We want to tell them about, you know, their politics. And we label them. God doesn't label anybody. He calls us by our name. He gave us an identity. And and when we understand um, the promises of God, we step into that identity that he made us and we get rid of all the labels. Oof, that's so good. Because it, again, that word that comes up so often, identity, identity. So mm-hmm. under, so I guess what you're saying is that understanding the whole counsel of God gives you a much richer understanding of your identity. And when you have a full yeah. understanding of your identity, then you are able to fully occupy the promises. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly it. That's exactly it. So, you know, the other the other thing that is interesting, though, uh, to go along with, you know, Jesus movement, Calvary Chapel was it was, you know, the power of the word of God, the power of the promises of God. But it was also the power of the Holy Spirit. You know, that's what what drew me to the Lord. It was hearing the word, but then having the experience of the spirit, having the spirit of God speak to my heart. You know, hearing the audible voice of God speak in, you know, just, you know, rock my entire world. And and that is something, you know, the power of the word and the power of the spirit. That's really been the fundamental, uh, you know, foundation of Calvary Chapel. Yeah, I, 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 it's interesting. I, I hear things, you know, as kind of a novice to the whole church history thing, right? And... Mm-hmm. I often find myself really listening to you guys talk about the history of the church and the word and Chuck Smith and his real emphasis on learning the word. And he's still my favorite. Like my favorite uh, Bible commentaries are written by Chuck Smith. I mean, for those of you watching, I've often sent you guys to blueletterbible.org. And then if you're reading and you can go to commentaries and study the Bible with Chuck Smith's written commentaries because he made it so simple and he did go like that word by word understanding of what you're going through. And why is it so important? You know, I, I'm thinking about today and a lot of the different movements and teachers and preachers. Why is it always at the end of the day about the word? Why do we go back so often to the word of God? Well, we run our lives based on words, don't we? I mean, yeah. if you think about it, uh, you're, you're going to make a financial investment. What do you do? You call up someone and you get the word, mm-hmm. you know, so you're basing your financial, you know, security on a word, you know, a book you've read or something like that. It's written on a word. Well, God's word is the only word that has solidly st- withstood the test of time. It has never failed. It has always been secure. It's been true. Um, we were in Israel recently, and you know, the, uh, our tour guide says, you know, archaeology has yet to disprove the Bible. They try to, but every time they go in there and they start digging things up, it only confirms what the Bible says. So the Bible is the only book in the history of the world that is absolute truth that you can absolutely build your life upon. And so it's the only, it's why it always comes back to God's word because God's word lasts forever. It's, it's, a, it's a sure word. It's funny. It's literally, it's the, it's the oldest argument that mankind has ever had and is still having over yeah. whether or not the Bible is true, whether or not the Bible is this, whether or not the Bible is that. We keep always coming back to even that one fight. <laughs> yes, it's incredible. Right. And so when, whenever I get into that situation, I look at the guy and, and I just say, listen, dude, you're boring. Get a new <laughs> argument. You know, find something else because you're just you're just fighting a battle that everyone else has fought and they've lost. So just stop being boring. Be interesting. Yeah. You right. know, if you're gonna come after God, be interesting about it, you know? Right. Show me some real power. Do something that actually makes a difference, yeah. you know. <laughs> get get a new argument. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> do you do you think that we can have a revival again like what you experienced in the Jesus movement around the world? I really believe we're seeing the the signs of that happening. You know, I really think that we're kind of in that, you know, the the, the seed realm of that possibility. You know, mm-hmm. when you look at the unrest around the world, you know, I think of the, the 60s, it was turbulent. You had war, uh, there were riots happening on the streets of America. 
Um, there was a, just a, a, a tone in the nation that was very, you know, tense and anxiety ridden. And we're experiencing that right now, you know, in America. You look at uh, around the world, the financial crisis that's happening in different nations. You know, people are really coming to the point where they realize that all of these things that they thought were so secure, their currency, their government, it's insecure. It's, it's not, it's something that they can bank on. And they're looking for something real, something that they could base their life on, that they can put their hope in. And that was the environment that gave birth to the Jesus movement. And I really see that happening today. What were the years, just to set context, what year, sort of what was the time frame of the Jesus movement? Um, I want to say that it began kind of in the mid-60s and went up into around the mid-70s. Those are kind of like the, the, the time frames. Right. But in all reality, you know, what we're seeing today is, is really an overflow of that. I mean, the whole Vineyard movement, you know, Vineyard, people don't realize this, came out of Calvary Chapel. Um, you know, it was, it was Calvary Chapel, Yorba Linda. And, and then, uh, and so, you know, it gave birth, it came out of Calvary Chapel. Um, Maranatha Music, which was kind of the, the, um, the sound of Calvary Chapel, if you will. And, and that was really the precursor to the whole Christian contemporary music scene. Uh, the worship that came out of Maranatha Music. Um, a lot of people don't realize that, you know, John Wimber was on staff with Maranatha Music. So Vineyard Worship came out of Calvary Chapel. Uh, in, in fact, Integrity Music approached Maranatha Music at one time and, and they, you know, Maranatha helped them get started in the early days. And so, you know, really all of the worship that we see in the world today, um, the uh, many of the movements that are happening are really can be traced back to the Jesus movement and to really the Calvary Chapel. Wow, that's, incre that's incredible. To, you know, I've seen documentaries on the Jesus movement and just seeing the hippies there on the cove in Laguna Beach getting baptized in the water. And there was really, it, it's, it's almost... It, unfathomable to take in because you're looking at something from, you know, from my perspective, I'm watching it going, that's, I've never seen anything like that in my lifetime. You yeah, know? it was, it was definitely a special moment in history, but I believe that it's going to be repeated again. Mm. You know, one of the things that I was, had the privilege of doing, you know, when I came to Christ and, uh, you know, I, I uh, started working at a Christian bookstore um, that Christian bookstore, you know, said, hey, we're starting a Bible study. They found out I played guitar. They gave me praise one through four, a couple songbooks, said, learn these songs. That church became uh, Calvary Chapel of Vista. And at 16, I became a worship leader. Well, fast forward that now, you know, many years later, I, uh, you know, through God's grace, I became the worship leader of Calvary Chapel Costa Mesa with Pastor Chuck Smith and was on staff there. And and as I'm, you know, as I'm beginning to find out what songs are really, you know, in the hearts of these people, it was praise one through four. It was the songs that I learned in, in those early days, not knowing that God was preparing me to later be a part of this church. You know, also, you know, having being the a and director and the marketing director for Maranatha Music, and then from that position, learning about what God did through the bands and how God birthed worship into the world through Maranatha Music. It was just an incredible time of just learning and understanding and seeing, you know, how God just used a humble man. And Chuck Smith was, was one of the most humble people I've ever met, mm -hmm. used a humble man who didn't want any of the glory, didn't take any of the glory for himself. And, and through his generosity, was, I mean, he, he literally, God used him to change the way church happened mm -hmm. in the world, mm -hmm. you know, and all the thousands of people that came to Christ, you know, it's just unbelievable. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm sitting here thinking about, you know, the different things that we think are music movements today. And, and certainly, you know, there's been things, Christina and I speak about this sometimes, like how Misty Edwards and Mike Bickle in the House of Prayer sort of birthed something. Mm -hmm. but, and a lot of those guys went to Bethel and pe Bethel's kind of got its thing and Hillsong's got its thing. But in listening to you, it's really evident that those things couldn't even exist without what happened through the Jesus movement. Yeah, I mean, because, I mean, think about it, you know, before that, the worship 
was pianos and organs and choirs. The, you didn't have bands. You didn't have like drums in church. In fact, you know, when drums came into the church, when Chuck Smith brought them in, you know, they thought Calvary Chapel was a cult. And so they were like, don't go to that cult church. You know, they have drums in their worship, you know. And I could, you know, there was, even as a young Christian, I mean, there, that was kind of a, a big argument was, you know, hey, stay away from that, you know, rock and roll, you know, cult worship music. You know, they call it worship, but it's, you know, that cult music, stay away from it. Right. Um, and so, you know, I remember, you know, thinking, oh, the only legit music I could listen to was like gospel quartets and all this sort of thing. Yeah. And I was, you know, I was trying to fit in. I was trying to listen to it and like go, like, I really like this, you know. Uh, but then when I heard my first, you know, Christian rock band, I think it was Petra, and and they were they were like going for it. I thought, nah, I don't like that. I'm gonna go with what I really am, you know. <laughs> yeah, and I'm sitting here laughing because I was raised Catholic, and so there weren't even, I mean, a drum, there, there, a, 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 and well, we had organs. Nobody really sang. It was very different, and mm -hmm. it's funny. My mom to this day still. She's still a little bit like, oh, you go to those churches where they jump up and down a lot. <laughs> yeah. Or where, where the music's really loud. But it's really cute because she invited me to her church recently and they have a piano in their Catholic church now. And they had someone actually sing a little bit. And she thought that yeah. was very hip and progressive. And so I was very proud of them. <laughs> yeah. Well, I was talking with um, Odin Fong uh, recently. Odin Fong was uh, in the band Mustard Seed Faith. Uh -huh. which was one of the pioneer bands. And I was just talking to them about the kind of the spiritual climate of the church today. And, you know, and I was like, what is the difference? You know, we see kind of what's happening with the, with some of these different movements and versus what you experienced in the Jesus movement. And the, the number one thing he said really kind of took me back. He says, the difference is that in the Jesus movement, it was really spontaneous. I mean, we didn't have plan. People are talking about what's the vision for your life. We had no, we didn't have vision. Right. We showed up and God just started doing things. Right. But then, you know, all, as these other movements came out, what they did is they tried to now organize the Holy Spirit. You know, you take a class on, you know, here's the five things you need to know to deliver people from demons. Well, in the Jesus movement, you would show up and start worshiping and the demons would just start manifesting. They would start, you know, they would start shrieking because they didn't like to be in the presence of Jesus. You know, there wasn't, we didn't have to like get into their mommy issues or their daddy issues. We just brought them to Jesus and Jesus set them free. It's the same thing with drugs, people that came off of drugs. You know, they didn't have to go to 12 steps. They went to one step, Jesus. And Jesus delivered them, you know, of all of their, you know, they didn't even have uh, withdrawals because of Jesus setting them free. And it was a spontaneous move of the Holy Spirit. I love it. And that's one of the things I'm missing today is that there's not that spontaneity. It's organized. We've organized the Holy Spirit. Okay, you know? so, 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 in, so not wanting to organize the Holy Spirit, this is what I'm going to do because we're out of time. I'm going to just ask you if you'll join us again next week so we can finish talking some more about all of this. And then I... We're going to give you guys some practical how to read the Bibles, but I'm, 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 I think you're enjoying Pastor Holland as much as I am. So come on back next week. I'm Cynthia Garrett. You've been watching the sessions, and we'll see you. We'll see you with more. <laughs> Let the glory of the Lord
everybody. It's me, Cynthia Garrett, and I hope you're enjoying the sessions. And I just wanted to drop in on you and remind you to pick up a copy of my book, Prodigal Daughter, A Journey Home to Identity. I wrote this book because I realized that we are all prodigal kids, you know, and there was a time in my life when I ran off looking for love in all the wrong places and ended up in a world of trouble. But I've met my maker and I found my identity in that mess that God turned into a message. So you can go to CynthiaGarrett.org and get information about how to get my book online and at booksellers everywhere. I promise it'll bless you.